Um, I want to welcome you again to Cross Community Church. If you don't know me, uh, my name is Jason Waymeyer. I'm one of the the elders, uh, the lead pastor here. Uh, we've been in this series over the last few weeks where we've been looking at some uncommon characteristics of disciples of Jesus Christ. The invitation of Jesus to every one of us uh, wasn't to pray a prayer or walk an aisle, but it was begin to follow him. And so as the Apostle Paul wrote to the young man Timothy, who Paul would often leave behind at, at churches that he had started, these young churches, and he said to Timothy, he said, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youthfulness, because you're young, which by the way, if you're under 40, the Bible calls you young, so just accept that on you right now. Uh, if you're older than that, uh, you should already be living these things out so you don't get a pass either. But he says to Timothy, he says, don't let anyone look down on you because of your youthfulness, but instead, you should set an example for all of the believers in your speech, in your conduct, in your love, in your faith, in your purity. And so what, he, what he's telling Timothy is that for followers of Jesus Christ, who, who say we're not just someone who prayed a prayer, walked an aisle, goes to church, but instead we're followers of Jesus, that we ought to be marked by this uncommon conduct. Our speech ought to be unique. And so week one we told you that when people interact with followers of Jesus Christ, they ought to be able to know every single time they interact with us that we're going to be absolutely truthful. We're not going to be shading the truth, hiding the truth, but we're going to bring the full truth to people they should be like, I look forward to doing business with Christians and followers of Jesus because I know they're always going to be fully truthful. And the, and the second part is they're going to be loving, which means there are some things we say because we love other people, and there's some things that we choose not to say uh, because we love other people. And then last week, we talked about our conduct more generally. And because of who Jesus is and because of what he's done for us, that we ought to be marked by uncommon service. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ, humbled himself, and he, he stooped to the level of being a bondservant, who, who served even to the point of being um, crucified on a cross for us. And so we as the people of God, in following after Jesus, we do as he did. We serve with this uncommon service. And we talked about our, our sexuality. We talked about our integrity. We talked about our purity, that those we ought to be uncommon in how faithful we are to those three things as well. Now, this week, I, I'm going to be honest with you, we have a really challenging topic. Um, it, it's uncommon love, that somehow followers of Jesus Christ ought to be marked. We ought to be uh, kind of set apart, setting an example that other people would strive to attain to in the way that we love one for another. As a matter of fact, Jesus Christ in John chapter 13, he said, hey, you want to know how the world's going to know that you're Christians? You want to know how people are going to determine that you're my disciples? It's by the way that you have love one for another. This divine love that we're talking about today is not common. It's not what the world often thinks about as love, but instead it is a divine love uh, which is profoundly different. And so today I want to talk to you more specifically about what that is and how we could live that out. Now, before we get there, I want to kind of set the stage for how important this is for us. Not only are we supposed to be marked by this divine kind of love with which we love one another, uh, here's what the Apostle Paul would say. He wrote this to the church at Corinth, and we should hear it today in the same way. If we are the church of Jesus Christ and we do not have love, we have nothing. Here's what he said in 1 Corinthians 13. He, Paul said, If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but I do not have love, I have become only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Listen, if, if we are persuasive and we are winsome and we are like those people that people hang on our every word, but we don't have love, all we're doing is making noise. He, he goes on in, in that passage. He says, if I have the gift of prophecies, prophecy, I know all mysteries, I have all knowledge and I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but I do not have love, I am nothing. If I look up at Kavanaugh, I'm like, you know, a little bit to the left. If I've got this really bold faith, I have all knowledge, I can fathom all mysteries, but I don't have love. I've got nothing. And he continues, he says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, I'm that guy, I give it all away. I surrender my body to be burned in the flames, but I do not have love. It profits me nothing. If there was a central message for this entire series, it's this one. It is the message of love. Jesus told us in the two greatest commandments, the first greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second is like it. 
Love your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus goes on to tell us that every law, everything you're going to read in the Old Testament, everything you're going to talk about in the New Testament, every one of the prophets, he says, all of that hangs on these two commandments, to love God and to love other people. As we approach this topic, we should approach it uh, with a sense of urgency because if we don't get this right, we miss everything else. As a church of Jesus Christ, who are following after him, we ought to live lives of uncommon love. So I want to do my best to talk to you about what that is, and I'm going to be honest with you, it's not easy. It's hard to define love, uh, in particular, in the midst of the culture in which, which we live. So if you have your, your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to 1 John. We're going to be in chapter 4, beginning in verse 7. Before we get there, I, I want to talk about some worldly definitions of love, or maybe how the world would think about love. Um, the, I, I googled this because I, I thought that would be helpful. So uh, if you were to Google what is love, you wouldn't just get Hathaway, the song, right? You're going to get a few definitions there in Google. The first one is an intense feeling of deep affection. When, when I was in college, one of my roommates, he starts dating the girl who is now his wife. And he came in so sappy. You want to talk about intense feelings of deep affection. He woke me up one night after going out on a date with her, and he was like, oh, my gosh, my, my face hurts. And I'm like, what are you even talking about? Why are you waking me up? He's like, when I am with Julia, I smile so much that my face hurts. Like, it's sore after I've, I've been with her. And so oftentimes we think about love in those terms about how we felt when we started dating our spouse or our significant other where our hearts are going pitter-patter and we have these just overwhelming feelings. But if you've been married longer than a week, you know that you don't always have these deep, intense feelings of deep affection, right? There are days where your spouse just doesn't feel it for you, and maybe you don't feel it for them either. If that's our definition of love, I'd say we've fallen far short. That's a cheap substitute. Another definition in, in Google, it's a great interest or a pleasure in something. And so I enjoy apple pie. Isn't it interesting that in our culture, we use the same word to talk about how we feel about our grandmother and how we feel about her apple pie, right? It's not very descript, is it? It's a word that's kind of lost its meaning in many ways. So what we know is there are a lot of cheap substitutes out there for love. It's, it's a fleeting feeling. It's a, it's a longing for something. It's something that I kind of take joy or pleasure in. Well, when, when the Bible talks to us about love, if we're going to love in the way that Jesus Christ has called us to love, uh, there's something far more profound there for us. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to jump into 1 John chapter 4, beginning of verse 7. And I'm going to do my best to tell you what love really is. Chapter 7, this is John who was one of the, the closest disciples to Jesus, the one whom he loved. Uh, he loved Jesus enough that he was ultimately boiled in a, a, a vat of tar. Uh, he survived it somehow. He got exiled to the island of Patmos. That's where he wrote Revelation. But we have this letter in 1 John, and he's writing to believers in, in various places, and he says this to them. He says, Beloved, it's important, those who are loved by God already, he's writing to Christians. He says, let us love one another. Like this ought to be a natural part of our everyday lives. We ought to love one another. And he says, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who doesn't love does not know God, for God is love. Here's what you need to know about the type of love that we're talking about today. It is divine in origin. God himself is love. One of the reasons we have such a hard time wrapping our minds around a definition of love is because God is love. It's who he is. It's a part of his nature and character. And God is far beyond us. Like, if you read in 1 Corinthians 13, it's the love chapter. It says love is patient, it's kind, it's not self-seeking. It, it, like, there's all these things that kind of, kind of talk about love, but nothing really defines it. And that's because God himself is love. He's beyond our comprehension. He's beyond our definition. Like, we're natural created beings. God is supernatural. He is divine. If we're going to love as Jesus Christ has called us to love, we have to understand that it's not something that's just here. It's not within ourselves. It's not within creation. Love, as it says in verse 1, is from God. 
And in order to walk in this, we have to first receive this from God. And so point number one I want to give you today is that we cannot know true love until we first know God. We were made to know this love. We were made to walk with God, to know his perfect love that casts out all fear. That we would just come before God as we are, no fear, no worries, no concern, no anxiety. That we would just walk with God in his perfect love. But there's a problem. And it's true of every single one of us. Sin. To sin is to fall short of God's standard. God was perfect in all of his ways. And when, we, when sin entered the, into this world, when we told the lie as a kid, we, I don't know if y'all stole candy from the grocery store, but I did, right? When we sinned in any of the myriad of ways that we've sinned, um, sin became a wall between us and God because God is perfectly holy and we were utterly sinful. Uh, the scripture would say, what fellowship does light have with darkness? They don't mix. And so there was this dividing wall of sin. When I was in college at Oklahoma State, I lived in the Campus Park Apartments for a, a little while. And I lived there several months, maybe even close to a year. Um, and, and I lived on the interior of the apartment. So there's kind of a big circle of buildings. I lived on the inside. And one day I was driving on the street outside of the apartments, and I see a young lady who's standing outside of her door. I didn't know her, never met her, but I could tell that she was obviously panicked. And so I, I stopped there, and I, my roommates and I, we get out, and like, hey, what's going on? And she's like, my apartment is flooding. And so I'm thinking, okay, it's a toilet leak, and we can probably handle this. But no, no, no. It was like the main line for the apartments that had gone upstairs, and there was water, like, rushing through her ceiling. There were a couple of inches of water in the floor of her apartment. So we go as quick as we can, and we get all of her stuff out of the water, hopefully to safety where it wouldn't be destroyed. Um, and that's about the moment that we realized that her apartment shares a wall with ours. And so if there's, you know, this much water in her apartment, we're like, oh my gosh, like our stuff. And so we, we run around to our side of the apartment and somehow, some way, I don't know how it happened, the water did not get in ours. I, I still to this day don't know how it didn't, but our, we didn't get wet at all. It was all fine. And then and my roommates and I were talking about, like, hey, have you ever met that girl before? I was like, no, I've, I've never seen her. And we thought about how odd it was that she lived so close to us. I mean, just separated by a wall that was so thin. I mean, I'm talking five or six inches, you know, is the, the thickness of that wall. And yet we never interact with her. We never met her. We didn't know her. And yet we lived just, just inches from each other, like living our lives together. In many ways, when, when we don't know Jesus Christ, when we're still living in our sin, when we're still saying, hey, the way I relate to God is on the basis of my own goodness. I've never trusted in Jesus Christ to forgive me of my sin, to cleanse me of all unrighteousness. But instead, uh, when I relate to God, I, I think maybe I'm a pretty good person. The scriptures would tell us that there's still a wall there. If you sin even one time, there is a wall between you and God. You can't know him. And yet, there's a solution to that. To, there's a way that we can know God and thus know true love. Read with me here in verse 9. He says, By this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. My, mother, my daughter makes a joke uh, about me. Uh, she's not actually joking. It was a pretty honest conversation we had one day where uh, she's like, hey, Dad, I know what you do at your office all day every week. I was like, okay, what, what, what do I do? She goes, you sit in your office and you study big biblical words, don't you? I was like, no, that's not what I do. Well, she's like, well, I hear you. You get up on Sunday and use big biblical words. Well, I, I hope that that's not actually true of me. But I do want you to know there's, there's a couple of really big biblical words that are profoundly important for us in this text. When it says in verse 10, not that we love God, but he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. He's saying a lot there. That word propitiation, it kind of has, there's a twofold purpose to that word, twofold meaning. The first meaning is this, that Jesus took away our sins. It's, it's actually known as expiation, which means he removed them from us. So Jesus, he came to earth, he stepped down out of heaven, he took on flesh, and he lived in this world just as you and I lived, only he did so perfectly. 
He didn't sin, not in a single way. He lives his life. He's betrayed by his closest associates. They abandon him. He's falsely accused. He's arrested. He's brought in the house of the high priest. They took turns mocking him. They hit him. They bound his hands and feet. They whipped him. Ultimately, they place him on the cross. And there on the cross, what God did to those of us who would come to faith in Jesus Christ is that he took all of our sin, your past and those days that you're ashamed of, those dark days that you never want to revisit, your, your present sin and even your future sin. God took that and he laid that on Jesus. He literally took your sin away. It's as if you and I owed a debt. And God took that debt and he gave it to Jesus. But the second part of that word, the first part is that he took it away. The, the second part of it is that he satisfied the debt. He made what's known as an atoning sacrifice for sin. The wages of sin is death. And there on the cross, Jesus died so that you and I wouldn't have to. Jesus paid the full debt or the debt in full for our sin. So he took our sin away. And he paid the debt in full. And what he did there was he tore down that dividing wall of hostility so, so that, it, as it says in verse 10, or verse uh, 9, he says, so that we might live through him. We might make a life together with God where we can see his great love for us. We can see how God operates. We can receive this divine love that we might extend that then to other people. So point number one is that we can't know true love until we know God, but there's really good news. We can know and love God because he first knew and loved us. We can know and love God because he first knew and loved us. Verse 9, by this the love of God was manifested in us, that God sent his only begotten Son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for us. Listen, there is this myth that exists in our culture today that what we really need to do, if we're going to come back to God, we've got to get our stuff together. Right, we've got to clean up our language a little bit. We've got to dress a certain way, make sure we're going to go to church. We've got, we got to get ourselves together in order to come to God. We've got to clean ourselves up a little bit. But here's the reality. That, that's a foolish myth. The reality of it is, is that God saw you in all of your mess, in all of your brokenness. He saw every, every uh, sinful thing you've ever done, every lie you've ever told. He's seen your addiction. He's seen your abuse. He's seen it all. And even when we didn't love him, even when we didn't acknowledge God, we sinned against him, we went our own way, we did our own thing, God still loved us. And he sent Jesus Christ to die on our behalf. Remember as Jesus hung there on the cross, there were the soldiers who had beaten him, those who had whipped him, the ones who had driven the thorns into his head. There were the guys who drove the nails trying to figure out who was going to get his garments. There were the men who betrayed him, his own disciples. You remember what Jesus cried out, knowing all of their sin? He cries out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they do. You see, this divine love of God, the thing that we're called to extend to other people, is so much different from what we experience in this world. In this world, we often give people what they deserve. Or we love people on the basis of what we can get back from them. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I love people that love me pretty well. I loved my granny, right? I, I have a great grandmother that I knew every time we went to her house, we were going to get fed and we were going to go home with a, a jar of jelly, various kinds. And as a kid, I remember thinking, I cannot wait to go to my granny's house because I'm going to get fed. It's going to be really good. And to be honest with you, it is easy to love people like that. It's easy to love people who enrich us in some way, who have something to give back to us in return. But Jesus points out, he says, hey, if you just love those who love you, isn't that what the Gentiles do? He actually uses the word sinner there, which if you would have lived in the first century, the word sinner was talonus. It meant tax collector. That was the worst possible status you could have among Jewish society. You were the worst of sinners. And Jesus says, Hey, if you just love those who love you in return, even the biggest of sinners do that. Have you really done anything? But instead, what we're called to, beloved, let us love one another, 
is to exhibit this kind of divine love one for another. The love that Jesus showed us when the only thing we brought to the table in our relationship was our sin, was our unfaithfulness, our brokenness, our weakness, and yet God chose in his divine love to love us enough to make the ultimate sacrifice of his son, Jesus. The good news for us is that we can know and love God because he first knew and loved us, and then he's going to call us to manifest this kind of love for the people around us. The third point is that God's love is manifested to us and ultimately should be through us. Look here in verse 9. He says something kind of odd um, that I'm not sure that if I was writing the scriptures, which I didn't do, and God uh, obviously was sovereign and did this on his own. He didn't need my help. But I, I don't know that I would have done it this way, but he, he's saying something significant here if we pay attention. He says, by this, the love of God was manifested in us. Now, the word, the word manifested here, it means revealed. It means made known. By this, the love of God was made known in us, or the, the love of God was made known in our lives. It was put on display in us because Jesus, God sent his only begotten son in the world so that we might live through him. And so what we ultimately do when we love other people is we give other people as God has given to us. We give them what God has already given us. And so I want to give you two facets of this unconditional, or of this love of God, this divine love that we are to display to other people. I already kind of let the cat out of the bag here. The first uh, point of God's divine love is that it's unconditional. What God didn't do is look around the room and think, you know, she's pretty smart and he's a hard worker. That guy, he keeps his word. She's a pretty good old gal. I think I want him. And that's, that's not what God did at all. God found every one of us completely undeserving of his grace, completely undeserving of his mercy or his forgiveness or any of the good gifts that we receive from God. And yet God not because we were necessarily lovable, but because God is love. It's who he is. He chose to love us with this great love and then to lavish his grace on us. God's love is unconditional. Listen, some of you feel like you're not lovable. Some of you, when you think about your relationship with God, it's like, ah, oh, I can't pray. Man, I've sinned so many times. I can't relate to God. I've gone astray so much. I haven't even taken the time to, to pray or to read. I don't know enough of the Bible. Listen, God's love for you is completely unconditional. And in the same way, our love for our fellow man, and, and let's not just say fellow man. That's kind of vague, right? Your love for your neighbor, for your spouse, for your kids, for your friends, for your coworker, and yes, even your love for your enemy ought to be unconditional. As followers of Jesus Christ who have been loved unconditionally, we ought to give this same love uh, to the people around us, which means we love people even if they vote differently than we do. What people experience, what is revealed in our lives when we interact with other people is the love of God, this unconditional, overwhelming love that God shows to us that regardless of how they vote or how they think or the lifestyle that they might lead, regardless of, of like the decisions that they make, of where they find themselves in life, what people ought to experience, the uncommon thing people ought to note about the people of God is they have this uncommon love. It's not conditioned on what I can get back in return. It's not not conditioned on how good I am or how wealthy I am or how prosperous my life would be, but instead they just love me, whether I'm at the top or whether I'm at the bottom. The people of God, I know that they must be disciples of Jesus Christ because they love me unconditionally. Church, when we fail to do that, when we say all the right things and have all the right truths and do all the other things, but we have not love, we're only like a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. But when we have love, it is this unbelievable, this overwhelming, unconditional love of God that speaks of the goodness of God to people. When we love other people in this way, we are revealing the very nature and character of God to them. Jesus, hey, people are going to know that you're my disciples when you love them like this by this love that you evidence, that you show and reveal one to another. 
The first thing I want you to see about the love of God is that it's unconditional. And the second is that it's sacrificial. To truly love someone requires sacrifice. To truly love someone requires sacrifice. It's going to be costly. You know, it's easy to take whatever you had left over this week and you drop it in offering plates and you're like, okay, the church is going to take care of those people, whoever they are. You know what's hard? You know what's truly sacrificial? Is to give up something that you otherwise would have enjoyed. To say, I'm going to cut back on lunch this week. And I'm going to dial back on some of the spending this month. And I'm going to find somebody who's in need. And I'm not just going to drop money off, but I'm going to show the love of Christ with them. I'm going to walk them through. I'm going to take them shopping. I'm going to buy them the food. I'm going to enter into their lives and their brokenness. I'm going to sacrifice my time and my money and my energy and even have to say no to some of my hobbies in order to love them. You know what Jesus Christ did when he saw the brokenness of this world? He stepped down out of heaven and he entered into it. He got into the middle of it sacrificing even his own life that we might find new life in him. This is how God manifests the love of Christ in us, that he loved us in this way, and we ought to display that to the rest of the world. Here in verse 11 it says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. There is this really foolish cultural definition of love that honestly, it's made its way into our church. And rather than saying, I'm going to love unconditionally as God, I'm going to love sacrificially as God, we instead, we settle for a cheaper version of that. It's just, it's, it's, it's the love that is unconditional acceptance. That we can see people, their lives are headed off a cliff. We know that what they're doing is going to lead to their destruction. We have the truth of God. Jesus is like, hey, I am the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No man comes to me except, or no one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus inviting us to follow him. We know the truth, but there's this tendency for the church of God, rather than stand up and be sacrificial and to love people in a way that might cost us, that instead we'll just step back. Unconditional affirmation doesn't matter which way they're going. It doesn't matter how bad they're about to wreck their lives. That we just It's unconditional affirmation. Hey, you do you. Thumbs up, brother. I'm with you. And rather than pointing people to the truth of Scripture and risking something, maybe the cost of a conflict, maybe them being upset with us, maybe it's not being thought of as well as the people around us, Rather than loving them in a sacrificial way and being willing to pay the price, we just applaud people as they head off the cliff, as they go out and destroy their lives. You know what Jesus did? There, there was a woman that was brought to Jesus Christ who had been caught in adultery. And the men who brought the lady to Jesus, they wanted to stone her. They wanted to condemn her. They wanted to put her to death for her sin. And so Jesus, he, he stands up for her in many ways. He's like, hey, I don't condemn you. But then you know what Jesus does? not condemning her. He truly loved her. He said, now I want you to go and sin no more. The church of Jesus Christ loves people. We do so unconditionally. We do so sacrificially. If the love that we're showing isn't costing us something, we're not really loving. So today, as the people of God, if you're here and you're a believer in Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you to live out this uncommon love. If God has so loved us, we ought to love one another. If you're a believer here today, I want to say when you leave this place, you go sit down with family or in the restaurant, that no matter where you are, you reflect this unconditional sacrificial love. Listen, overtip your waitress. She may not deserve it. She might spill your drink. She might bring your food out cold. You choose to love her and bless her in the same way that God has loved and blessed you. And you do this for your neighbor and then your coworker and your spouse and your family. And everywhere you go, you express, you give to others what you have received from God. You live this out. It's manifested in you. And you preach the gospel and the love of Jesus Christ with the way that you ultimately live your life. They're going to know us by our love one for another. Now, if you're here today and you're not a believer in Jesus, maybe you're here because you came to watch baptism or, or you're just here because it's Father's Day and your kids twisted your arm, uh, here's what I want you to know. Jesus Christ has been coming after you. 
He loves you. He loves you in all of your sin, in all of your shame, in all of your brokenness, and he desires that you might have this life too. And so today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to put your faith and your trust in him, to begin following after him as well. Would you bow with me? Father, we are thankful that we serve a God that didn't require a sacrifice of us, but instead made one for us. God, we, we praise you that you are a God who loved us in this, this way that's really beyond description, that it's hard for us to comprehend. But that's who you are. You are a God who, who loves us unconditionally and sacrificially, and so we want to praise you in this moment. Lord, I pray that we would be a people who exhibits this, who reflect to others what you've given to us. God, help us to love one another as you've loved us. And God, I pray for the person who's here today that doesn't know you, that's still behind that wall, living life really closely, uh, maybe with you, but doesn't actually know you. Lord, I pray that they would see today that the love of Jesus Christ has torn down that wall and that they can begin to live in a relationship with you and know you and live the life that you call truly abundant. We pray that today would be the day of salvation. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.